When somebody screws you over, your response might be stronger than you think. Why do you get angry when you are treated unfairly? This is the University of the Netherlands. Do you recall a time when you felt treated unfairly? Maybe your boss chose someone else for a promotion instead of you. Or maybe you received a grade in an exam that was less than you felt you deserved. Or perhaps you see examples of injustice in society, discrimination against certain groups, or extreme financial rewards for unworthy bankers. This unfairness likely evokes some particularly negative emotions, disgust, frustration, or even anger. In this lecture, I'll explain how unfairness influences our choices, how unfairness impacts the brain directly, and why we should take it into account when thinking about large-scale social problems. First, let's make clear about what kind of decisions we're going to talk about. Usually when people think about decision-making, they think about individual choices. What apartment should I rent? Which course should I take? Or even what topping do I want on my pizza? Now, to make these types of decisions, you need to understand what's important to you. You need to figure out what the possible options are, and then you pick the best one available to you, given your own preferences and given the constraints of the choice. So, for example, if I desperately need a new pair of shoes, I need to buy what's available right now to me. But when I'm going to buy a suit for a more important occasion, I'm going to take my time and find the right one. But there's another important class of choices which we can call social decisions. Now for these decisions, you need to know not only your own preferences, as we just talked about, but it's also important to understand the preferences of other people you may be interacting with. Now this is not necessarily because you care about the feelings and beliefs of these other people, although it's nice if you do, but because this knowledge is useful in order to make a good decision for yourself. A good example of this is a business negotiation. So to make the best deal for you, you should try to assess what the other person is thinking, what they care about, what they don't care about, and so on. So these types of decisions, where we're interacting with other people, are very common. But they also generate a certain set of important motivations. For example, if we're trying to decide whether or not to cooperate with another person, this can be influenced, of course, by the pros and cons of the situation, just like in an individual decision, but it can also be impacted by social emotions. So perhaps we want to feel the warm glow of helping another person, or alternatively, we might want spitefully to take revenge on someone. Today, I'll talk about the role injustice can play in making social decisions. That is, how does the feeling of being treated unfairly influence the type of decisions that we make? I'll talk about how we study this in the lab, but also how about how it can impact our perception of important social issues. Let's take a football game as an example. Now in football, we know there's lots of emotions, especially amongst the supporters. You feel happy after your team wins or sad after they lose. And of course, these emotions can influence your actions. But what happens when you also feel treated unfairly? In 2009, the Irish football team lost a very important game against France, a playoff for the 2010 World Cup. After this defeat, the Irish supporters, and I'm one of those, were naturally sad and disappointed. But in this case, there was something else going on. For the winning goal, one of the French players clearly cheated. Everybody saw it, except unfortunately for the referee, the only person who could do something about it. But the goal was awarded, France won the game and marched off to the following year's World Cup. Now, what's interesting about this situation isn't that a professional sportsman cheats to win a game, that happens all the time, but rather the reaction of the Irish people, again, also including myself. People in Ireland got extremely angry, not necessarily because they lost, but because they felt they lost unfairly. There was a protest to the French government. There were questions raised in the EU Parliament in Brussels. And most ridiculously, a large amount of people actually took the day off work to march to the French embassy in Dublin and shake their fists at some poor French embassy workers who clearly had nothing to do with this. But what this illustrates, I think, is that when people feel they're treated unfairly, it really gets them upset. Now, you could say, of course, that the Irish were upset about not winning the game and simply shows what bad losers they are. However, there's a really nice, useful example here where Ireland had played Belgium about 10 years previously, also in a playoff game, and also they'd lost. But this time it wasn't unfair, it was just sports. 
And again, people were sad and disappointed, but this time they weren't marching to the Belgian embassy or burning Belgian chocolate in the streets. With the French game, it was the unfairness of the experience that influenced people's decisions so strongly. And we see this all around ourselves. So on somewhat more serious matters than football playoffs, we can also witness this really fierce response against injustice when people march against unfair bankers' bonuses or racial inequality. So we can see that all around us, the experience of unfairness can play an important role in our decision-making. But how can we study people's response to unfairness? Ideally, we'd like to do this in a more controlled, scientific way. Because we can't just arrange unjust sports defeats regularly, in the lab, we use experimental games where we study how people share resources amongst themselves. In these games, we're interested in whether allocations are typically fair or unfair, and in particular, what do people do in response to an unfair division of resources? Now, one of the simplest games we study is called the ultimatum game. Here, two players have to share a sum of money that we provide to them. In our studies, we use real money. So based on the agreement you make with the other player, who's usually a stranger, you could potentially walk away with actual money from this task. So in the ultimatum game, player one, who we call the proposer, makes an offer to player two, who we call the responder, as to how to split, for example, 10 euro. Now let's imagine you're the responder in this case. The proposer can make any offer they want to you. So, so for example, they could say five for them, five for you. They could say seven for them, three for you. They could say six for them and four for you, whatever they want. However, once they do make their offer, you have a decision to make. You must decide to either accept or reject this offer. Now, if you choose to accept, the money simply gets divided as proposed, the game's over, you go home with your winnings. But if you choose to re reject, then nobody gets anything. So the interesting question here is what do people do when they get a very unfair offer made to them? So say when the offer is nine to the other person and one to you. Now clearly this isn't in any way a fair division. Why should they get almost all of the money and you get so little? But the question is here, what do you do? You can say yes and you get a euro, though of course this other guy gets nine. Or you can say no and nobody gets anything. Now, classical economic theory predicts that you would always say yes, because the one euro you receive from accepting is always more than the zero euros you get from rejection. But in reality, this isn't what typically happens. What we find is that about half of the time, you'll say no to such an unequal offer, even though it means you actually get nothing. So we can say here that the aversion to unfairness is so strong that it can even overcome the temptation of free money. It simply just feels more satisfying to punish your partner for such bad treatment. It'll cost you a euro, but it's gonna cost them nine. So this is a clear response to unfairness in terms of people's behavior. And we can also see this reaction to unfairness directly in people's brains by letting people play these games while we scan them using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Using this technique, we can see what parts of the brain are particularly responsive to these unfair scenarios. One area we find consistently active when you experience unfairness is termed the anterior insula. The greater the feeling of unfairness, so the lower the offer you receive in an ultimatum game, the more activity we see in this brain region. And this is very interesting to us as this region has often been implicated in dealing with negative emotions such as physical disgust and physical discomfort. But here then we find it's also responsive to moral pain and moral distress, the feeling of unfairness. Now we've done lots of experiments trying to investigate what are the specific factors underlying unfairness. We want to know how stable are these feelings of unfairness. And we'd like to know what exactly people are willing to do as a consequence of feeling unjustly treated. If we look at the factors underlying unfairness, one aspect that seems particularly important is the expectations we have, what we feel in advance about a situation. So if we expect a situation to be fair and just, such as in, for example, an official FIFA refereed football match, we're much more likely to react strongly to unfairness than if we already had lower expectations about the likelihood of fair treatment, like if I was playing football in the park with my friends. So in the ultimatum game, receiving a one euro offer from a person we thought was fair, 
and we thought was reasonable is much more aggravating than receiving the same one euro offer from somebody we already knew to be shifty and untrustworthy. And indeed, we see this act reflected in our brain activity. The insula is more active when we get the one euro from our formerly trustworthy friend than when we get it from the shady character. So how about the consistency of these feelings? So maybe you think, you know, I have a good idea of what I find fair and unfair, and it's pretty much set in stone. A lot of people believe this, that they have a firm moral line. So you might think, I'm someone who would never accept one euro out of 10. That goes against all my moral principles. Or alternatively, you might think, I would always take the money. It just makes most sense. However, this level of stability is not always the case. Depending on the context, people's idea of unfairness does shift, and sometimes quite substantially. One obvious example of this is whether you, for example, have benefited from the unfairness yourself. So we often don't complain when unfairness goes our way, when it works uh, for, for our own benefit. So the French football supporters weren't marching in protest at the unfair goal that sent them to the World Cup, only the Irish supporters who lost. Our principles can also shift as a function of the source of the perceived unfairness. Now we talked about this earlier in the context of expectations, how about what we expect to happen can influence how unfairly treated we feel. We can also see changes in our moral stance depending on who we are interacting with. If we go back to the ultimatum game, imagine that the proposer who has just offered you one euro out of 10 is a poor student with holes in their pants. Now, usually in this case, people understand why the student has made this unfair offer, and so they usually agree to this split. But now imagine how you'd feel if a rich businessman CEO type tried to make you the same offer of one euro. Then I don't think you'd be quite as forgiving of unfairness, which shows in principle how our flexible our fairness preferences are. We've also extended our explorations to look more specifically at what you want to do to people who treat you unfairly. In these experiments, we offer you the choice to punish someone who has previously been unfair to you. And in this case, punishment means you can find them some money in the experiment. Now, you won't receive this money yourself, but you will have the satisfaction of knowing that this other person will get less as a result of your actions. But the catch here is that this is what we call costly punishment. That is, you will have to pay money to cause them harm. Now, it's a good deal, as every euro you spend will reduce their total by three euros, but still, by punishing them, you will end up with less money at the end of the experiment. So what do people do? Well, again, we find a strong role of unfairness here. When another player treats you badly, typically, you are, in fact, willing to spend your own money to punish this player and sometimes even quite substantial amounts. And this is even the case when the other player does not know who is punishing them. But there's simply satisfaction on gaining revenge on those who treat us badly. And we can also see this reflected in the brain by increased activation of the reward system when people engage in this punishing behavior. So that is the part of the brain that responds to positive stimuli usually is still active when we punish unfair partners a seemingly negative action. So what can we do with this information? So we know now that a feeling of unfairness can greatly influence people's decisions and actions. So just think back to the football game I talked about in the beginning and the angry Irish people shouting at those poor French embassy employees. In the lab, I've shown that we can examine the feeling of unfairness in quite a bit more detail, both in terms of behavior and in the brain. We can explore the specific circumstances that lead to these responses and also observe the reactions to unfairness. So we can therefore understand at a much deeper level more about our conception of fairness and unfairness. With this information, we can gain greater understanding of what provokes people to feel unjustly treated in the real world in more serious situations in football games. So we're sensitive to what's fair and unfair and it's important then to realize that people will typically respond very negatively if they feel they're being treated unfairly, especially by entities that they expect better from, for example, government or other such institutions. Finally, we can also potentially use this sensitivity for social good. So perhaps we might be more likely to act on important issues such as poverty and climate change if these problems were framed as injustices either an economic injustice to a certain type of people right now, or an environmental injustice to future generations.
perhaps then we could harness the power of unfairness to generate positive change. Thank you for watching and listening.